Hello and welcome to the Southwest Creative Technology Podcast, a podcast all about exploring some of the exciting creative technology projects and talking to the people who make them happen in the Southwest and beyond. I'm your host, Harrison Wilmot. In this episode, myself and Lucas Robbins, my producer, talk to Jane Gauntlet and Sharon Clark in a relatively quiet corner of the Bristol Old Vic. We recorded them having a fascinating conversation that encompasses their research and activities during the Immersion Fellowship, of which they are both industry fellows, and their shared experience of immersing audiences for their particular flavours of theatre. I begin the podcast by asking them a rather difficult question. What have you been up to during the fellowship? Jane, do you want to go first, my darling? What have you been up to since the fellowship? I can start. In the fellowship. I can start. I mean, maybe I should start with why I decided to do the fellowship, Mm. because I think that was sort of, when I started, it was because I had gone from theatre to interactive audio to interactive theatre, to writing for games, to making work using video goggles, to making a 360 piece which was designed for a medical conference, to it being showcased at Sheffield Documentary Festival, and then I found myself touring my work and finding myself in this weird whirlwind of marketing and tech and words like immersive and groundbreaking and innovative in a world where everybody wanted to be the first, the first to make a feature length piece, the first to make this, the first to make that. And I think I just started to feel like a robot and I decided to apply for the fellowship because I really wanted to stop and think about the work that I was making and why I was making it and what I wanted to make next. I'd sort of found myself in this really competitive world and I think as an artist I don't try to be the first. I think we understand that we can't own concepts and it's all about the quality of the work. There might be lots of artists making work about similar subjects but we're all doing it very differently and it's all about the quality of the content and about the audience experience. That's something that I just felt was so different about the VR world is that I realised, oh, this is a really great way to never work again, that so much of it was about ego and so much of it became about using the wonder of the technology Mm. and forgetting about the audience experience. And I think I started to get too closely involved in that. So I just really wanted to pull myself out of that and think about what immersive means. And for me, most of the immersive experiences I've had have been in theatres and at bus stops and on trains and um, radio plays and um, podcasts, newspaper articles. Um, So I just really wanted to explore what immersive meant to lots of people. So I talked to lots of theatre makers about what that meant. Mm. And to most of them it was a buzzword. One person that I spoke to that's been making interactive theatre for a really long time um, said that he made a really large scale performance and he wrote the blurb for it and then the venue added an immersive experience to the blurb and he found that really hard and the reason why he found it hard which is what I completely understand is that you shouldn't tell the audience what something's going to be if you tell someone something's immersive then it's it's why do you need to tell them that shouldn't it just be immersive and it's the same with when people say, and that's something that comes up a lot when I've seen VR pieces, is people plonk a headset on my head and say, you are going to love this. That's another massive difference. Mm. That never happens when you go to the theatre. Yeah. Sharon, I can't imagine you standing outside the venue saying, oh, you're really mm. going to love this. And I can imagine what you'd say to anyone that worked at the venue that mm. said that to anyone that came in. Mm. You know, for us, it's much more, well, for me, and I... I'm just making assumptions. It's more about watching audiences. I like listening to hear what people say about my work in toilet queues. Mm. I'd put a dictaphone in the toilet if it was legal, Mm, just to hear what people really think. So that was what the fellowship was about for me. Um, And it was also about all sorts of things that I came up regarding ethics. So I found myself in a documentary world and my background's in charity. I worked for MenCap and Mind for a long time. and just the way people sort of VR in this whole, it's an empathy machine, it's this, it's that, it's going to change this, these huge statements that theatre never makes. Mm. You don't read a theatre blurb, it doesn't say, well, you, you might, you're unlikely to read a theatre blurb that says it's going to change the world or it's going to change people's attitudes. That might be written in a review, but it's never going to be written in the blurbs. Um, and I think that 
it just really made me think about the impact of storytelling. And I felt like in VR, there'd been a lot of work about the impact on the audience, but my thoughts were very much about the impact from the very beginning, the impact of the people whose stories are being told. And I started doing some research into people who've made work about themselves, mm. people who've made, had work made about them, people who've made work about other people and audiences that have been impacted by what they've seen. And the reason why is because I've been in that situation. Mm. There was a documentary made about me in 2000 and something or other, a long time ago. And it was really odd watching my story told by other people. And the people would stop me in the streets and pity me. Mm. And it's like, that wasn't the story I meant to tell. I don't need pity. So it was in response to my own personal experiences, but also in response to the work that I was seeing, what I was seeing happening in these places. I'm also doing an awful lot of talking. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's me speaking okay. whilst I try to remember everything. It's okay, it's fine. So that was, um, that was why I did the fellowship. So it was really very much for me as an artist to explore that and to make a plan for the next few years. Um, and I haven't made any work that I've been proud of for a really long time. So I really want to do that. So it was very much research into how I can make something that I feel really proud of and that I feel I'm taking creative risks with. Did your perception of immersion change from before you went into the fellowship and then during and then now during it? Did my perception change? I found it really interesting to hear what everybody had to say about. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think that's really important. One of the things that going into it, I know what my perception of immersion is, and then going in and people hearing how strongly people judge that term, how people how strongly people put a structure on it was quite extraordinary. Especially between what I call analog and digital immersion, is there was a great deal of debate about and certain certain people feeling that their version of immersion was the version of immersion was quite extraordinary. And it's a bit like saying, what's your judgment value on theatre? What is theatre? And therefore this judgment value of theatre is right and this is. So that was very interesting because my, my perception of immersion didn't change much. But listening to everybody else's, I suddenly realised that there were some constraints that, that people put upon themselves where immersion was concerned. We should just say we're in the Bristol Old Vic, which is gorgeous, aren't we? Me and they love. Um, and the door that's banging a lot in the background is Jen's toilets, because that's where we are, <laughs> me and Jane. Um, we and like the, to hang around there. We like to hang around the Jen's toilets, Bristol Old Vic. And the zhuzhing noise is people uh, grinding coffee beans. So actually, we are an immersive environment with you sat at mm. home as we speak. So, uh, Sharon, um, what have you been up to during the fellowship? <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to make me laugh so much. <laughs> it's a bit like I've been bunking off school, isn't it? Um, <laughs> same, well, I went in for this, exactly the same reasons as Jane, as you, Jane. Um, is uh, Once again, we're artists, we do. I was talking about this this morning, actually, with somebody else. We tend to do, we tend to throw things at the wall, see if they stick. Yeah. If they don't, we think about it a bit, then we go and do it again. And then we do it again, and then we do it again, until it's approximately near what we wanted. So the so the fellowship, for me, exactly the same thing, babe, is, is a, 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 the, the luxury of thought, is, is having some time out to sit. I did a lot of reading, which I don't normally do around practice, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, but I don't read much around my practice. To do some academic reading, which I've done, <laughs> but I've never really liked it but this time I did I found some really interesting thought provoking stuff that people have been writing um, and just to think about why I do what I do why is immersion so important to me what is immersion to me what is my own definition about it um, and so to sit down and actually have a think and then somehow try and reflect it back out was really interesting though at the same time the doer the arena of do was never far from me. So also I wanted to make some kind of physical iteration of something that I'd been thinking about and that was around extending theatre performance. So I'm quite interested now, I'm a playwright ostensibly, uh, straight, what we call in my company, my straight plays. I don't even know what that means. Um, but um, I have a, a company where we make immersive theatre as we know immersive theatre um, with digital technology. And so I also wanted to use the fellowship to kind of kickstart some of the thinking and doing around our next 
stage of development in what we wanted to do. So uh, during the fellowship, I was really, really interested in how we extend. Somebody's very busy in the gents' toilets, aren't they? I wonder what's going on in there. We'll go and find that out later, mm. Jake. Um, is um, I was, um, we were wanting to think about how we extend the theatre experience outside of theatre walls. So how do we break theatre stories out of theatre walls is what we were interested in doing. So the fellowship gave me time to really think about what that meant and then also to have a tiny wee play at what that could possibly look like um, and and how we could, how audiences might feel about that. Audiences are always at the centre of what we do and I know Jane for Jane too but something with my company is, is at the centre of what we do the audience comes first. We think of an idea or concept we might want to follow or that we're intrigued by, but then the first question is always, what would somebody else make of that? What would they think about that? Why would they come and see it? Why would it interest them? How would it engage them? All those huge questions that people forget with immersion is inbuilt into your very early process is about that other person or those other people or the why would they come? What Why would it be important that they're there with us? Um, so we were looking at how we can extend a theatre a theatre experience so it starts five, six hours before you get to the theatre and ends seven or eight hours after you leave the theatre. But, of course, the big question is, does anybody want it? Does anybody want to be spoken to while they're at work? Does anybody want to start a theatre experience while they're doing the hoovering at home or sat on the toilet or having a shower? Is it invasive or is it pervasive? Was the question we were asking ourselves, basically. Do you have an answer for that for us yet? Oh, God, no. What are you, what, 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 are you mad? <laughs> have you any answers? I don't even have the questions still, love. Let's be honest. Uh, yeah, uh, no, we don't. So off the back of that, I've got a question here for both of you. Um, do you think... Uh, hang on, what have I got here? All right, here we go. How do you feel immersion changes audiences? And I'm not just talking on an individual level. No. As a group think type um, experience. That very much depends on what you mean by immersion. Well, uh, from your interpretation of immersion, then. From our practice. Yes, from your practice. From our practice. Um, I think, and it's been really great to hear Sharon speak and to get to know Sharon a bit, um, in thinking that the experience starts, for me, it starts the moment you read the blurb, mm. the moment you take an interest in an experience. And then the next stage is when you book, and that's part of the experience. Then when you turn up at the venue, that's another part of the experience. Um, the minute somebody says something that's out of character or out of um, the environment, audiences are thrown. So it's about thinking, about making sure that it runs really gracefully throughout the whole experience, that they're just taken through that. And I think also what, and I know, had Sharon speak about this and we've spoken about it what audiences take away um, in terms of yeah immersion it's about constantly focusing on the experience and making sure there's nothing that will distract from that I think that's one of the most important things in my mm. practice mm. Um, and I think at some point along the way when I made a piece um, called intimacy I was quite nervous about showing it it was very much an experimental piece and from, but from that piece, what I learned, it was for two people, it was a virtual reality piece for two people. What I learned was that I care less about what they think of my work and more about the human connection afterwards. I really enjoyed that they stayed around together and spoke to each other. Um, I got an email from someone recently saying that they dated the person they did it with for a few months. Um, I think Catherine Allen employed one of the people she did it with. I might be exaggerating, yeah. I might have made that up in my head, mm. but it's, I find that really interesting. So in terms of immersion, I think it has the potential to connect people. However, that happens at theatres. Mm. When you go and see a theatre show, I went to see Bryony Kimming's yeah. show, um, I'm a Phoenix Bitch, and I, that's one of the pieces I've seen most recently that I found really immersive, and that's because audiences connected. Mm. When the lights came on, nobody could move. It was like they were spending a few minutes trying to remember where their feet were. Mm. The story had been so immersive and people were talking to each other that didn't know each other because it was that sort of, oh, we've just 
Come. You've, we witnessed something together. You've experienced something. It's a collegiate Shared experience, experience, isn't it? Yeah, where and that you can't force that, and you can't always, unfortunately, build for that. Sometimes that magic happens, and sometimes it doesn't. But it is around the strength of the performer where Brian is concerned. Uh, she is an, an incredible performer who will draw you in, and having a solo performer, especially, makes you have a relationship with her because it's just her, and a lot of her work is autobiographical. So you're right about that. Sometimes the theatre itself, very by its very nature, is immers immersive. Um, uh, and I think sometimes thinking about audiences, it's very interesting. You said something earlier, which, um, which, which is something about audiences I've been thinking about recently or that I've realised recently is the word for me, interaction or interactive theatre and immersive theatre are totally separate. Um, uh, so sometimes when audiences hear those titles, you were talking about this earlier, which is really great. When audiences hear those words, they immediately have a barrier put up, yeah. especially interaction. What are you going to make a fool out of me? Are you going to make me look silly? Am I going to be out there with my ass hanging out and everyone's looking at me? I'm not a performer. And the same with immersion sometimes is they, that they can, they have a particular viewpoint of immersion which doesn't always trust the maker to keep it a safe space for them. So sometimes those words, when we use those words together as artists, which we do frequently, sometimes when I play them back to an audience, you can hear the gasp of almost sheer horror <laughs> at the point that they might have to have some agency in. Yeah. So sometimes you're right that we don't actually have to use that word immersive to them. And sometimes we shouldn't because it scares the horses and the children, darling, sometimes. Absolutely, and um, also as a writer and director, work, and you must know a lot about this, um, as a writer and director, you can tailor work so that some people can be more immersed than others yes. and be more involved than others. And it can be a conversation you have beforehand, which I think that sort of stunts things a bit, but I hmm. think quite often performers are so um, intuitive hmm. Um, if you work with a really great team of performers and you sort of work on that in rehearsals, you must know much more about this than mm. me, um, you can work about intuition because the minute you look at someone, you can usually tell mm. if they want to engage with you. Yes, yes. Even just one word, you can mm. say, oh yeah, and you, and you can see if they want to play with you. You mm. can really, it's really obvious. Mm. Um, so it's about that. It's about designing work that um, accommodates um, if people really want to be in, you know, different levels of involvement. I guess. Yeah, I think with audiences, you're absolutely right. I think it is about making a piece of work where if they want to get down and dirty and rub their nose in it, they can. And if they're slightly hesitant, not hesitant, that's not fair. That's human nature to be hesitant yeah. in that situation. But if they want to be more observant than participant, they can. And as a, I, I'm controversially maybe, but as an art, as a, as an artist working in that field, I feel we should hold both, and that we should be concerned with the levels of comfort that our audiences go through, especially if they're new attenders to immersion. Is you don't want to go full on hardcore immersion straight away. Is there is something skillful that needs to be done, and I don't know if I've ever got it right yet because I think it takes a long time to do where those who want to really sit on the chair and play with the chair and see if there's magic buttons anywhere can do all of that. But those who want to just stand back against a wall and watch that happen, they feel okay to do it. And that we've written and made something where they feel totally at their own level of comfort. They find their own level of engagement. And I think if you try and push it too hard, then that's where it becomes problematic and you can lose the narrative very easily. Absolutely, and I veer enormously from being really shy to being really boisterous. Yes, so that's dependent a really good point. on how I'm feeling, mm, mm -hmm. um, and actually, when I've been feeling very shy, something which calls itself immersive and interactive immediately becomes the least immersive and interactive piece I've mm. ever seen because I'm constantly worried that they're going to ask me something, and I, I'm listening to what's being said so carefully, just in case they quiz me on it that I'm not in the experience, mm. and I'm bracing myself to be pulled forward or to be asked to do something 
So in a way, if something labels itself as that yeah. and doesn't do it gracefully enough, it's usually often the least immersive word. Yes, yeah. and I think it's a lovely word you just use. I think graceful is a really, it is almost balletic. I think the way that you try, well, the way we try to think about audiences and their movement as a kind of as a kind of being, as a sentient animal, is the way that the audience might move, where they might look, how we might. Uh, focus their gaze at one moment in what is a very big space because we make work in found spaces as you know is a you know how do I ga- uh, focus their gaze in this tiny little moment down here on the floor that we need them to look at how do we think about them as that gaze I mean in somewhat somewhat what's the word somewhat concretely or, or uncreatively you know we literally have <laughs> I shouldn't really be saying this I don't, I don't know if I should be saying this but we literally have an Excel spreadsheet of narrative beat on one side and where we think the audience might be, where we want them to be, what we may want them to feel and how their leveling of engagement is. And then next to it, what's their level of comfort? So if they're being just told, not told, if, if, if there's a moment of pure narrative, purely live performance led, that's it, that's all that's going on at the moment, is I know their level of comfort is going to be very high because they're just stood listening. But then... If, for instance, we are asking them to pick up what looks like tombstones and put them around their neck and fiddle with something, that could make their level of comfort quite low. So we actually chart it Great. on a chart and I guess where also, we think... Sorry if I missed you saying this, but no, it's okay. also that what if they're not doing any of those things? Yes. What if they're trying to get out? Yes, exactly. You, know, you sort of have to prepare for all of this. So mm. What if they're not? Yeah, what if they're so uncomfortable? And we've had it where you know people have felt a little bit faint or um, or just discombobulated or uh, we, we did some work in tunnels and somebody felt claustrophobic is having escape routes for everybody where we can just help them remove themselves from it in a, in a graceful way again which is a lovely word I'm going to nick that off you Jane <laughs> graceful um, uh, and and so that the audit the experience and the world we've built isn't isn't collapsed by it yeah the question I really wanted to ask you actually Sharon is um, in terms of audiences, mm. so when you're making this work and advertising it, do you feel like um, saying uh. it's, I haven't really, I should have swatted up on the way you do this but um, maybe I'll do that afterwards, but mm. when you're writing immersive and interactive, do, do you think it pulls in a specific audience, do you think it immediately means that you have a similar audience for so, each piece, so. I guess the topic always brings in different people I think I think it's really interesting what you said because we've actually made decisions on one way and then the other so we made a decision yeah. one way and then we changed our mind completely so we decided with our first show the stick house not to use the word immersion at all and actually not to work, use the word theatre at all so it was a kind of I don't know what we called it we didn't call it anything I just think I think we just went this is a story this is what we're looking at and we decided not to use the word immersion um, and then afterwards, the feedback we got was really, really interesting because people were saying, I got there and I got in and um, uh, I realised it was an immersion show. And actually, most of our audience wanted it, immersion. They wanted immersion. So they came out and they said, we wanted you to tell us it was immersion because I've had more people to come. Okay. More people, I would have bought more people and gone, this is an extra selling point. It's in a space we've not been in before. I'm going to be told a story. I know it's got film and I know it's got music. And then somebody said to me, but if you'd have said it was immersive, I think eight mates would have come with me. And then I realised that in Bristol, that Punch Drunk and Everybody was punching through in London. But in the Southwest, there wasn't that much uh, immersion being made in found spaces. So actually we'd lost a little bit of a march on that one. And then we started to call ourselves an immersive theatre company, and then things changed. That's really interesting. Do you think it changes with funding when you're writing applications? Yes, it does. Yeah, it absolutely does. Because it makes you, you've got a USP, which we were missing, I think, or that we hadn't really thought about. So with audiences, but it didn't, but it also, I thought it would mean, if we use the word immersion, I thought our audiences would go niche into like, you know, I don't know, I'm about to say something really horrific there on, on tape and I won't. Um, but it would go in, into real sort of that very niche audience who are into technology and are, are into gaming and, you know, that, I thought, oh God, we're going to... And actually, you know, I was quite surprised at how many, even using the word immersion, 
we had natives, immersion, immersive natives, we call them those that go to immersion a lot. And then we had a widespread of people for whom it was their first experience. And that's why they came. It's because they've never seen immersion before and they didn't know what it was. What do you say when you make work? How do you talk about your work? How do I, well, I'm just working that out. So I'm currently going through a phase of, so I started, you know, kind of using um, headsets um, as an alternative method of communication. So it was, I found a project called the In My Shoes Project, where I started recreating real life experiences using audio, and then I discovered video goggles, and that seemed like a straightforward plan and we made things with budgets of sort of 50 pounds and they were experiments and it was really good fun I got to learn a lot about how far I could push audiences mm. um, so the first piece I made was called Wakey and Slough and I dress audiences up as me and I give them the headset and say these are my eyes and then the headphones and say these are my thoughts it was actually made for me to communicate with my consultant and my friends and family um, but we sort of decided to test it out in theatres and took it from there I've completely forgotten the point of the question. The question was about how do, how do you use the word immersion when you talk about immersion. your work? Or because you use, yeah. you use VR quite a bit as well, don't you? Or you play with VR yeah. and live performance. So I sort of went into it um, quite accidentally in a way. Um, and I think that's partly why I wanted to do the fellowship, was think about it's a horrible way of putting it, but rebranding myself. Mm. It's how do, I, how do I talk about my work? What do I write? Um, and also in funding applications, I found that really hard. It's what language do I use? And also when speaking to tech companies, what language do I use? Yeah. Um, and I haven't quite answered that question. Mm. I think um, I'm probably going to have to, I might have to ask your advice. <laughs> and, um, I think I'll just see, because I want to make a lot of different types of work. Mm. That's my plan for the next year really, is to play around with lots of ideas and make a lot of mistakes and um, learn mm. from that. Yeah. Because um, I actually, I do feel really shy about using the word immersive because I mm. feel, it's like back to you're going to love this. If somebody says that to me, I'm immediately cross. <laughs> yeah. I immediately, don't tell me how I'm going to feel. Don't tell me I'm going to be happy. Don't tell me I'm sad. Don't tell me I'm going to love it. And if someone tells me something's immersive, then I feel quite shy about that. And I feel like if I'm promising to an audience, that it's mm. going to be immersive, then it puts a huge amount of pressure on me and what they expect because they might the audience yeah. might have a different idea as to what immersion is exactly. to me. And we always talk about audiences as if they're this massive, huge one one headed monster, yeah. don't we? What 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 do audiences think of immersion? I don't bloody know what audiences think of immersion. I know what a couple of people think about it who sometimes are in an audience. But how do I you know, when I say and I feel complicit in this because when we're making work I say you know where is the audience and it's like well it it, it, it is a multi-headed beast this thing and it has its you know and you're right about um, us not thinking about how you how the emotional response to the word immersion from different people it's really really important um, so yeah I think we have to be very careful when we talk about audiences as if it's a one one strand thing because they are, you know, there are certain days I feel like going to immersion, there are other days I can't be asked. Um, there are always a lots of different things that, to be taken into account. Like um, when I was doing a show called um, Ice Rose, my friend brought her husband along who's Spanish. And he's a, a primatologist, a very clever human being. He works with apes. Um, and um, he uh, grabbed me. I'd never met him before, so it was a bit weird. He grabbed me at the beginning. He said, are they going to talk to me? I said, who? He said, the actors, they're going to talk to me. Am I going to have to do something? Oh, my God, I'm not an actor. Oh, my God, my English is terrible. And I suddenly realised for him, language was a problem with immersion because he was frightened he was going to have to respond in a way he couldn't. Uh, luckily, I went in and had his hand with him and he came out the other end going, oh, that was amazing. They didn't speak to me at all. I was like, no, it's fine. But there were those also small niche needs that is an immersive maker you have to think about is is language going to be a problem is accessibility going to be a problem you know can i take them to these places can everybody get there can everybody see you know and 
So I think we use that collective now, and really, um, it's a shortcut, I know, but it's quite dangerous. Absolutely, and I think um, access is a really big thing to talk mm. about when making any work. Um, and I see access as a really broad term. Yeah. It's not anything particular. It's access in nerves, it's access in language, it's access. And it's just sort of thinking about how to make the work accessible and it's how to avoid any level of shame mm. or guilt because people can feel really fear fear is a big one yeah will i break it will i look an idiot will i be able to engage with it you know will i you know all those things that we have to be so careful about because that brings you out of narrative doesn't it brings you out the story as soon as exactly. you have that moment of just going i i feel unsafe yes it's 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 that sort of, does it saying immersion make it less immersive for a lot more people yeah. than it makes it immersive? It's that sort of thing. I think I had quite an interesting experience. So um, I have aphasia and it's gotten a lot better in terms of communications. It's I'm not very good so at So what's aphasia? Aphasia for me mm. is that quite often it's very hard for me to make the words that are going on in my head into words that other people can understand. Okay. So it's getting the message across. Mm -hmm. um, and it's much worse under pressure, so I'm not very good at being asked questions. Getting better, and I can't use that as an excuse. I'm a human as well. We all have that. You yeah. know, we don't like, you know, it can be really hard having questions thrown. But I went to see one of the first immersive theatre pieces probably a couple of years after the brain injury which caused this. And... Um, the interactive theatre performer kept trying to interact with me and couldn't. Um, and it was really interesting meeting him in the bar later and him talking to me. He just said, I had not prepared for this. Will you talk to me about it? Can you come in tomorrow and work with me on... You know, it was a real... And I think it's about awareness and it's about thinking, how do we make people feel back to comfort? Mm. How do we make people feel comfortable? Yes, exactly. And I think you touched on it earlier as well. It's not only as writers, directors, do we have that responsibility in immersion to make audiences feel that we're about to build them a world that they will immerse themselves in. We don't have to do anything for them. If the world is strong enough and big enough and interesting and curious making enough, then they will immerse themselves. We don't, we don't have to hold this exactly. baby. They'll walk in, somebody's there, they feel safe. They will just relax, like a bath, they'll, they'll just relax. They'll pick up the baby and they will, yeah, exactly. you know, kind of feel comfortable with that baby. Exactly. That's a really great example. Yeah. It's that sort of... Yeah, that we, it is our responsibility. But at the same time, the deliverers of that piece on the ground, which is what you talked about earlier, about the, the actors, is making sure we also work with the right performers who in any one moment can read people beautifully. No, no. Sometimes actors don't understand this. That in immersion, they also have to be soothsayers and look at somebody and go, "It's okay. I can just nod at them because they look really uncomfortable with this." But the guy over there's gagging for me, you know. So I know that I can go over and he will play with me in, in this moment. Or this whole audience is quite on a quiet side. So fine, I won't push too hard. And that is something you work out in rehearsal, in mm. quite. And sometimes you have to rewrite stuff and for those performers, for them to be able to feel that sense of play where they can let go for a minute and, and, and be, just talk person to person, not perform, just be in that moment with somebody else. Yeah, I think, um, I hope this isn't too off topic, but I went to see a really great piece recently. It was at CoLab in London and it's called King and Country. All right. And it's possibly one of the best pieces of theatre in general, I don't even want to say interactive theatre that I've ever seen, and it's partly because they really, they did some really clever tricks. Mm. So I arrived at the venue and I knew the man making it and I knew that it was him on the door and he was all in costume in his army uniform. And I said, oh, hi. And he just was in character. Yeah. You know, yeah. he didn't even, st and I figured it was sort of actually, no, Jane, come on, you're not allowed to hug the soldier. <laughs> um, you know, kind of don't, don't do that. And then I went in and there's a bar and it's all set up mm. in that era. And there are people walking around in suits. And what they're basically doing is testing out how involved you want to be. But they're doing it in a really relaxed environment because it's a bar. I think you did something similar, actually. I think you yeah, we talked did. to me about yeah, we using did. the public space before. We look at who's who's alpha in a way, what we call alpha, we look in the bar. So we do the bar up and then we start from the minute you get in. But in the bar, we're all spotting who looks like the alpha female or male in the room, i.e. who's the one who's the most animated, who's the one who is talking to our, our actress um, used to give out flowers. 
she like a flower seller she'd go oh, take a flower my lovely and then we'd gauge by how they responded to her what they might do in that room exactly and then feed that back to our actors yeah exactly and also the bar staff so yes. they just sort of throw these questions at mm. audiences and if it was sort of a yes and no answer it was sort of oh yeah and then um all of the people in the bar were then performers in the piece mm. alongside other people but they'd worked out a way to make sure that information was shared um, but it was just so clever and I really tried to catch the actors out but they were in character the whole time even when we were over sort of in one space I could see the actors still playing character you know they were ready to be caught out and yeah. I think that's it it's don't ever break and I've heard a lot about this from your work as mm. well I think it's something you Mm. implement in everything that you do as well yeah, don't. once they're in the world you take their head back of their head you dunk them in the world once they're in they're in you can't pull them you can't go half in half out it doesn't work with immersion they've got to be in and the door shut and we're we're now here together and it's 1942 and it's russia and that's exactly. where we are and and it's okay to be there with us so yeah You touched on that a bit, haven't you, with the punch drunk being in London? Yeah. Mm. And audiences being curious and hungry and mm. and it's also does it give you license to take more creative risks because you're not being compared? I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I wonder how someone would feel if they came to see your work and then went to see a punch drunk show. Mm. I think they think mine was a very poor cousin. Um <laughs> no, they would. We don't have a lot of money. Um I think um it's hard to say because when we were talking about audiences earlier about you know thinking about the southwest is it once again it, we run into that problem when we talk about audiences about they are made up of hundreds of thousands of unique individuals with unique tastes so it's really hard to say i think i think in the southwest at the moment in terms of making theatre and making work, let's just leave immersion aside for one moment, but making theatre and making work and making, da and not dance so much, dance isn't doing so well in the South West at the moment, but um, is that the, it has always had, um, it's always had a culture of DIY, do it yourself. It's always had these brave theatre makers who have just gone, do you know what, bugger it, I'm just gonna do it myself and get up and do it. Whether it's in the street, whether it's at a festival, whether it, wherever, mad people doing mad and bonkers things. You think about Doug Francisco at the Invisible Circus and Loco Club and all the mad that genius human being has done. Those wonderful maverick people have always gone up. We're great in the Southwest for that. The DIY stuff has been, in terms of interactive work and immersive, mm. has always been the best. Yes. Because it's all about the audience. If you haven't got much of a budget, you know, you have to just kill every darling. Yes. You know, there's no, you don't have any, there's no space for ego, there's no space, you know, for trying to be too clever. Mm. So actually the DIY approach, I think, can mean that people end up making the best work. Mm. I've often found that I've had much better experiences when the work's lower budget and less. Yes, I, th I think I think that's right. So I think the South West, you know, has its own problems because it's such a huge area. So to get from here just to Falmouth in Cornwall is three hours by train and we're in the same ruddy region. And then from Falmouth to Land's End is another hour or so, or something ridiculous. So we are quite segregated and split. And we have sort of Bristol as the big mothership at the gateway. Um, Plymouth is really now becoming extraordinarily vibrant. It always has been vibrant, but now it's, it's people are recognising it for what it is. So that's great. But we've always, the collaboration, the DIY always seems to have happened in Bristol, um, mainly focused there, which is a real shame for the rest of the South West, I think, is that because there are great makers. Do you remember during the fellowship? I don't know if you remember this, that first day in Plymouth, and we had that big map. Yes. And we had to put on the map, do you remember? Yeah. Well, we had to put on the map where everybody was. And there was everybody on the south coast in Bristol. And there was Kate, who makes amazing VR. Yeah. One person on the north, the whole north coast of the southwest. There was nobody else. It was like a desert. And we were all around Plymouth, weren't we? Yeah. And Bristol, 
a bit down Bournemouth. It was just me in Exeter. It was just and you in Exeter, <laughs> yeah. bless you, my son, <laughs> holding up the Exeter end, good boy. Um, it, Not anymore. Oh no. Moved to Bristol. <laughs> 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 and their readers, listeners, is the whole problem with the South yeah. Earth. Um, but I, I think, I think, yeah, I think what we are nudging towards is that you know a lot of emotion is made by companies themselves taking the risk, putting it up, getting it on. And I think the Southwest, we have a huge back history of that. Do you think there's more potential for wonder? I think that's something I really like to think about when I'm making work is where's the wonder um, and that's something I've seen with a sort of huge shift in VR you know people don't feel that wonder they put a headset on it's it's gone mm. it's all about the content it's all about the narrative it's all about the overall experience and it's the same maybe um, you know kind of watching of the last 10 years watching interactive theatre and immersive work the wonder is sort of wearing off it's putting a lot more pressure on things and I think um, I wonder if that varies enormously regarding different things to people see I've said that really clunkily and no. I'm actually just thinking out loud no it's great good to think about that as... immersive media has taken the wonder out of traditional theatre and traditional mm. experiences and that's not so much I mean I guess it's if people haven't experienced so much or different types hmm. um, of work yeah it could be i mean i, I can't I, I between the four of us um lucas the um swockton fellow <laughs> producer is here with us as well just in case you wonder who the fourth is um is between the four of us who runs immersive companies in the southwest who can we think of well perhaps um, i shouldn't do that because it's insulting to people <laughs> but i'm just wondering about that landscape really maybe there is a moment where that is something we all look at is what that landscape looks like and where we are as, as a community of audiences and artists is where is our landscape and where can we be more collegiate where can we link up better where can we because sometimes i think especially with something like immersion which um, i'm sure you'll talk about with other fellows is incredibly resource intensive and hungry and let's be honest guys bloody expensive whether it's tech Absolutely. as you know jane whether it is a big space to put stuff in you know getting people in there and and dressing it and making that world is really really expensive so it could be in the southwest that there's something where we can share those resources where we can come together and manage those resources but I think we do have a very big gung-ho spirit. I just think we, we need our audiences to come with us and we haven't quite grown them enough yet. You know, I don't think we, we've really um, uh, helped them be as adventurous as they would like to be. I don't, I don't think right now. Um, and I think maybe there still is a little bit of a stick where immersion is concerned and certainly interaction is concerned. Um, yeah. I kind of come to a logical closure <laughs> with that. And that has so much potential because it's such a big region. Yes. There's so many people with very different skills mm. um, and perhaps with people with less experience of... But I'm actually, I don't really mean that. That's quite clumsily said. But it means it has the potential if those connections are made to make work that's of really interesting quality, to make work that's much more diverse, to make work... Because quite often that's something I've really seen with work that's made for virtual reality actually the best work is generally made by people that sort of ended up using the technology by accident yes yeah, or yeah, have yeah. never used the technology before mm. or you know don't come in at it with any particular you know sometimes we see really great theater pieces that are made by people that have come from a completely different platform. they don't recognize rules or boundaries they just because yeah. they, they don't know them so they just break yeah. them all the time yeah and that yeah. can mean that people make much more unusual interesting mm. experiences yeah yeah so yeah, I don't know if I can talk about Southwest audiences or, or artists particularly in any depth because we're just so massive and the, the the range of provision is so uneven. So you know we are a lumpy, bumpy old region. I think where that's concerned, but I think there is a huge untapped audience for new experiences, and it's certainly with the advent of digital technology. And you know, Jane, you know the change in the last six years alone, where we're coming on with things like Magic Leap and so quickly is I think if we can just take the labelling off it and just say, come and see something amazing and wond wonderful and we will make that happen for you. It doesn't matter how we do it. It doesn't matter how we do it. 
doesn't matter that I've used Magic Leap. It doesn't matter that I've used Oculus. It doesn't matter what I've used. But we're going to tell you a story or give you an amazing experience. That is all you really need to know. And this other kind of conversations are for us to talk about, the artists, because they're our tools. But you, the audience, do not need to see our tools. They should be invisible. Yeah, if you go and see a theatre show, it doesn't usually say you will see this on the stage. No. Immersive technology is a rapidly developing creative resource for theatre makers, artists, and all creatives alike, helping them bring a new sense of enchantment to their work. But there's still a huge part of the population for which this kind of technology is incredibly new and sometimes scary. One of the realizations for me that came from the Immersion Fellowship is how important it is now for us to work with audiences to establish new patterns of normal behavior around this technology, new rituals that can help us, as Sharon envisions, to make the technology invisible and the enchantment more real. At the moment, uh, I'm on the RSC Magic Leap Fellowship, which means I work with the Royal Shakespeare Company and an augmented reality company called Magic Leap, who are American-based. And I am looking at, with that fellowship, not immersion so much, but how augmented reality um, and uh, live performance can sit together in a piece of storytelling. Um, and augmented reality is where uh, you layer... Um, a, uh, a new reality on an existing one. So for instance, we're all sat together at the Brislavik around a table, there's four of us, I can see Jane, I can see you two lovely boys, and I can see the stairs, I can see everything. With augmented reality, I put on a pair of glasses, I can still see you all, and I can hear you, and I can feel you, and I can smell you, you're all very fragrant. And then suddenly what can come out of the floor would be I don't, a ghost or a dragon, or stars can come out, or so it's layered reality, a made reality and existing reality, which I find very, very exciting. So I'm working with the RSC on that, which is great over the coming year, which just pushes my curiosity in another direction, uh, but actually is still all around live performance and these new technologies. That's really what floats my boat. And then I am working at the moment in uh, first stage R&D for Raucous new show, The Undrowned, do you want to make a winter 2020 where we want to look at how we start a theatre story whilst you're journeying to the theatre? So before you even hit the theatre. Um, and then we are also looking at building our own space that we will uh, use projection mapping on and other things that we're known for. So we're looking to push it a little bit harder. Um, what are you up to, Jane? What am I up to? I'm currently working on my main project is called True Love and it's about the impact of technology on future relationships and it's using Magic Leap. So thank you very much Sharon for explaining what that is. Okay. Um, I think I did it very well. Magic Leap have got a lovely little a lovely little cartoon that shows everything, but obviously we're on a podcast, babe. We can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Yeah, sorry. Um, and I did a prototype of it last year in October, I sent a headset and mm. decided to just run at it. I had a really low budget, I could afford a studio for two half days, I worked with an interactive theatre performance, we worked on it for a week, we made it, we took it to Waterman's Arts Centre, we didn't tell anyone about it because I wanted to just show it to people randomly. I didn't want to say, I'm making a piece with Magic Leap, please come. Mm. I just wanted to say, we're doing this over here, do you want to join us? Um, and I wasn't sure it would work, so it was a really great test performance. We showed it to people of all different ages. I think that's a really important thing about audiences, the testing. When yes. I make work, one of the first things I yes. do is test it out on audiences. I think yeah. that's really important to my practice. It's what we do, yeah. It's all very well me sitting in a dark room coming up with ideas and testing things out. Actually, it's letting go of the mm. feeling ashamed or nervous about showing something that's not finished. <laughs> it's, it's basically, I'm going to show this and I'm going to lie down and wait for you to kick me and it was really great because we showed it to people of different ages and we showed it to an older lady who was in her 80s that her feedback was I've um, I haven't felt so sexy in over 20 years it's really made me think about my dating um, and how I should go back to maybe I should try online dating um, so we learned so much from that mm. showing it to different people that I've just decided that I really want to pursue it and develop it and turn it into a large-scale interactive theatre performance using the Magic Leap headset as the set 
um, and the directional speakers as the soundtrack. So it's basically an interactive theatre show that fits in a suitcase, which sounds really naff, but it's one of the better ways to try and explain it, because as Sharon knows, when we make interactive theatre or site-specific theatre, it's attached to that one space. Yes, it is, yeah. I want to be able to show it internationally. Mm. Um, I want to be able to... So that's what I'm exploring at the moment. Um, there's no specific dates. It's very much just... Uh, it's a very big project. I'm just running at it, and I'd really like to work with Sharon. Yeah, we've hoping... talked about collaborating a little bit on that. We're around me doing a bit of dramaturgy and story poking, poking story with, with Jane and seeing what, what comes out the other end, um, which has been obviously a result of the fellowship and has resulted actually from us mainly having off-site chats over coffee. So, Absolutely, but that's all way. dependent. Sharon's very busy, so it's all dependent on dates and <laughs> money <laughs> and that stuff. But yeah, so that's what we're doing. Um, if anybody is interested, um, I have a, uh, a website, which is www.raucus.org.uk. It's just being reskinned as we speak and redesigned, which is very exciting. Uh, but you can look on there and my contact details are all over it, as well as my colleagues. And you can see what's coming up and you can have a poke around what we've done before. Yeah, and my website, which that's one of my next tasks, is to update <laughs> my website. Um, I actually met someone on a train the other day and she asked about my work and I told her all about it. And she um, emailed me the next day saying, OK, so your website doesn't um, tell me about the feisty lady I met on the train. It looks a bit naff. <laughs> I, was, I can't remember the exact wording she used. So I'm meeting her for lunch to tear me <laughs> apart and I'm really excited to see what she has to say. Um, but it's www.janegauntley.com and my email address is underneath my name on the website. Thank you Jane and Sharon. It's always an absolute pleasure to hear you talk about your work and your insights about the immersive theatre world and I can't wait to get you both on the podcast again. If you're producing anything creative with technology in the Southwest or beyond, and would like to share what you're doing, let me know and together we'll make a podcast all about it. You can contact me via email, my address is harrywilmot at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening to the Southwest Creative Technology Podcast. If you enjoyed your listen and know someone who might also, please share it with them. The music you heard during the podcast were excerpts from Ending by Kamiku and I'm a Machine by Glass Lux which are both available on the freemusicarchive.org. I had some production assistance from Lucas Robbins and Hannah Brady on this podcast, and this particular episode was partly funded by the Southwest Creative Technology Network.